let's talk about uh, doing uh, t-tests with paired samples instead of with independent samples because this becomes a pretty critical issue um, because an awful lot of the data that we analyze in the behavioral sciences is paired it's paired samples data and that's uh, really it really gives us a lot of flexibility for instance your pl your classic pre post study where you test something before a therapy and after a therapy and a lot of the examples here are pre post examples that's a paired sample situation well this test unfortunately has many many names it's called the repeated measures t-test t-test for dependent samples test of differences between means from the same sample measured twice that's kind of a ridiculously long one that i had in one textbook um, it's all fairly silly test for the difference of two means with paired data they all make sense the long one is kind of silly but uh we, we kind of can't decide on terminology here so when do you use this you use this when you have paired data you have to look at the structure of the data so you need to have one group of subjects and two measurements per subject and the result you'll have two groups of observations but only one group of cases or participants or subjects that's paired data for you now you can't use an independent samples t-test to analyze paired samples data unless you're okay with coming up with really wrong answers and making science and statistics cry and hate you and vomit and things like that so here's your setup paired samples one group of participants two observations per participant so you measure something very very similar something I mean, conceptually statistically it has to be basically the same variable it has to make sense to compare it directly that's the thing you wouldn't ever want to do this with one variable that was say SAT scores and the other one was ACT scores they're on different scales of course there'll be a huge difference the statistics just test to see if there's a difference between means they don't test to see whether that makes any sense at all that's up to you make sure that things make sense <coughs> so we've got this setup here this kind of graph I've used before on the raw score level <coughs> in the sample you have sample mean one and sample mean two now with paired samples data what that means is that something happened to the participants that they had some different situation that produced the data from the, from sample one and from sample two the alternative hypothesis says that those two situations are actually different that that the difference between these two things m means something was meaningful um, being really generic here but we'll get into some examples later on so the alternative hypothesis says it's meaningful of course I the alternative hypothesis just says that the two means in the population are different it doesn't say exactly what they are so I just kind of made up some means stuck my graphs here but you should be able to read this diagram if you can figure out my previous ones because this is paired samples data what this means is that there must have been one group of participants and under one condition or one type of measurement or something uh, in one way of measuring this variable you got the blue data you got sample one that led to the mean the sample mean one x bar one <coughs> and under a completely different condition well the alternative hypothesis says it's different and it's meaningfully different we got from the same participants we got sample two with the mean for sample two now that's the alternative hypothesis the null hypothesis says that the conditions made no difference whatsoever you think they made a difference because of random sampling but actually what's happening here is there's just one group of participants and you did this manipulation or you tried measuring things differently but you're basically measuring the same thing the, the exact same thing twice and you're just fooling yourself because of random sampling into believing that there's anything other than just the same thing happening twice so the null hypothesis says there's no difference between the means and that's kind of what that means in terms of this uh, paired sample situation in either case we measure this difference just like an independent samples t-test and then we look at all possible differences between means that could have happened if the null hypothesis were true and the null hypothesis says there's no difference between between these means therefore the difference between sample means on average should be zero now our sample mean might be different in this case maybe it's up there or something and we get a t observed score maybe we did group two minus group one and that's how we uh, calculated that um, and then with the area beyond that is our p-value so that's the the independent sample setup the paired sample setup is pretty much the same in 
theory, it's slightly more complicated because you have to account for correlations between the observations at time one and time two, or condition A, condition B, whatever it is. They're correlated automatically because the same participants produce them. So you have to sort of factor that out and factor that into your calculations. However, in practice, this complication completely disappears because we just create difference scores. Every person or every case or every individual has two observations and we just subtract one of those from the other and, and that reduces things to one value. And this works because the mean of the differences is the same as the differences between the means. Now I'm going to stop here and demonstrate that this is true. I'm not proving it. That would require mathematical proof, which I'm not so great at. Uh, but here's a demonstration. Imagine that you've got one group of observations one, two, three, four, five, another one that's three, three, two, one, one. Now I made these simple so that they'd come up with nice easy means. The mean of group one is three, the mean of group two is two. Now imagine we take the differences. In every case we do one minus two. You can't just change your mind in the middle. If you're going to do one minus two you have to do it all the way across. This would work if you did two minus one also, uh, as long as it's the same direction. So one minus three is negative two, two minus three is negative one, etc. Now look at the mean of those and look at the differences here. It's the same and it always will be. So x bar 1 is 3, x bar 2 is 2, and x bar of the differences is 1. But also 3 minus 2 is 1. So the mean of negative 2, negative 1, 1, 3, and 4, the, that mean is 1. And that's the same as 3 minus 2. So subtraction in the same direction we did to create the difference score. So the mean of these differences is the same as the difference between the two group means. And we can exploit that fact to make paired samples uh, t-tests much easier to do. Now this mean of the differences, we're going to call it d bar. We're calling the different scores themselves d, and then the mean of them we're calling d bar. So the mean difference score instead of x bar. So let's look at a, an applied example. Let's imagine a treatment for social phobia. You have 12 subjects. The dependent variable is the heart rate of the subjects. And pre-treatment, we call that heart rate HR1. That's our variable. Our variable post-treatment heart rate, we call it HR2. And is the treatment effective? Now we would expect that uh, heart rate 2 would be smaller than heart rate 1, it would be lower than heart rate 1, on average, if the treatment's working, right? Because social phobia would make your heart rate high. So let's assume that HR1 happens when participants are put before treatment, before they have any therapy, in a room with strangers, and then you measure their heart rate. And then after therapy, you do the same thing. Put them in a room with strangers, measure their heart rate. There should be an average reduction if the therapy was effective at all. So operationally, we're saying, is X bar 2 the mean of HR2 variables? Is that less than X bar 1? Is there a reduction in the mean value of the heart rate? So here's the data that I made up, and it's fake. Uh, and you can see the mean and the standard deviation of each group. And then we could calculate for this paired sample situation. It's clearly paired samples because everybody got um, an HR1 and an HR2. It's a pre-post study. You get measured before the treatment and after the treatment, and that's a classic type of, of study to do. So it makes sense to subtract two from one. You could do subtracting one from two, but I'm going to say two from one just because I figure two will be smaller than one and one minus two will give us hopefully an average positive number. And uh, it turns out it does. So our different scores are here and you can see a few people had very high differences. So their heart rate reduced radically, 139 to 98, 126 to 86. So there are some people that benefited apparently greatly from the therapy. So the mean of all those different scores is 10.3, which happens to also be the difference between the sample means, 115.8 minus 105.5. Either way, we're going to call that D bar. And the standard deviation of the different scores is S sub D, so standard deviation of differences. So the mean of differences, standard deviation of the differences. Now I want you to focus on one thing for a second. The mean of the differences is, same as, is the same as the differences between the means, but that does not work for the standard deviation. The differences between the different scores have their own standard deviation. It's, uh, it has something to do with these standard deviations, but you'd have to add in some extra information and do some pretty funky math to figure out how it relates. It's not a nice simple relationship like the difference between the means and mean of the differences. You just have to calculate the standard deviation of all this stuff. That's what you have to do. Unless you do that, 
you can't figure out what the standard deviation of these is in general. So you can't just say difference between means is the same as that. You actually have to go and calculate this. Just a small side note. So here's our setup, and now I've put some numbers here. So heart rates. And here's our two samples. Sample two, <clears throat> actually this is reversed. Sample one and sample two. Actually, that should be sample one and that should be sample two. Well, let's do that. All right, now here's the setup that we have graphically using this system I've been using so far. We've got the mean uh, of sample one is higher than the mean of sample two. So sample one is the green and sample two is the blue. Um, and so we have the 115.8 and the 105.5. Okay, we didn't quite get it right there. Anyway, PowerPoint is hard, you guys. Uh, so anyway, but it's pretty close. And so we have these two sample means. <coughs> The alternative hypothesis says that the two population means that they came from are different in some way, but the null hype and, and it says that the heart rate at time two came from a completely different something, a different process, a different situation than the heart rate at time one. Now that difference should be the effectiveness of therapy. Therapy is effective because, uh, and it shows that there's a difference in these two means. That's what the alternative hypothesis suggests. So the clients are actually different after therapy, and that's why they have a different mean after therapy. Unfortunately, the null hypothesis has a different opinion, and it says, no, there is no difference. You just happen to have picked some participants who, through kind of random factors, ended up sort of having an average mean difference lower after therapy than, uh, than before therapy for heart rate. It just people's heart rates fluctuate. It's random. I mean, that's all that's going on here. The null hypothesis says there is no average difference in the population between all possible clients who could have taken this therapy um, in their heart rate after versus before therapy. It says there's no difference in all possible clients, but you happen to have selected some clients whose fluctuations in heart rate kind of made it look like there was a difference. So that's the null hypothesis. It's saying you're full of crap. There's nothing going on here got to pay attention to the null hypothesis because it's right a lot, at least right enough. So we calculate the mean difference between those, and we saw this on the previous slide, d bar, it's 10.3. The mean of the different scores is 10.3. The null hypothesis says the mean of all possible mean differences with random sampling from this paired populations who are the same population. So the, the null hypothesis says therapy is ineffective, therefore if you sampled millions and millions of times from all possible people who could take this therapy, there would be no difference between the pre-test and the post-test in their heart rates. The mu sub d would be zero. And so you can construct the sampling distribution of the means, and I spread it out so you can kind of see what's going on here. Now note this is a very different scale from these other things. This is heart rate, you know, from low to high, but this is differences between two heart rates. So maybe I should put a big jagged line between the second and third tiers here. Anyway, this is differences in heart rate, so mean differences. So this is beats per minute, but it's differences between time one and time two. So our mean difference is up here, and so our T observed goes there. And the area beyond that T observed is our p-value. We'll work through this in a, in a few minutes, but the paired samples t-test is set up the same way as every other t-test. You've got a point estimate. Now for a single sample t-test, that was one mean. For a two, a two sample independent samples t-test, that was x bar 1 minus x bar 2. For paired samples t-test, it's essentially the same. It might as well be x bar 1 minus x bar 2, but we're calling it d bar now. It's the mean of the differences. It's the same as the difference between means. We're just doing, doing that little flip around trick so that we can make the calculations lots easier. The null value is almost always zero because the null hypothesis mu zero is zero, that there should be no difference from time one to time two, no difference between measurement one, measurement two on average. And then we have a standard error and it has a formula. You'll be surprised that the formula is not all that complicated. Now let's assume we found P is greater than alpha in the previous situation, our T observed was here. This is how everything boils down. It's just, you just, uh, if you're drawing something on your graphing class for an exam or for a homework or 
an in-class activity. Just draw the curve. And the curve is the sampling distribution of all possible d-bars, of all possible means of different scores. And so the t-score for our d-bar, let's say it fell here and it wasn't quite in the t-critical region. So we don't reject the null, p is greater than alpha. So the logic is the same as the other t-tests. It's not uh, any different. It's just different in how you set things up and you've got to kind of keep that in mind as you go along. So the standard error of the difference is just like the standard error of the mean from a single sample t-test, not a two sample, but a single sample t-test. Because this is what we do. We take those different scores and then we forget about the original scores entirely until we're done with the, all the calculations. But during the calculations, we kind of pretend like those original scores didn't even exist. All we care about is the different scores and we treat them as if they were a single sample of something. We treat them as if they were just in a, a single sample of regular raw scores. So if D is an individual different score and D bar is a mean of the different scores, then the standard error of the differences, or the standard error of the D bar, is the standard deviation of the differences, of the different scores, divided by the square root of n minus 1. Now in some versions of the textbook, uh, they've kind of forgot the radical sign on one of the pages, so if you're using the textbook, you might want to check that out. So the in all these situations, you, you always have an estimated standard deviation of the sampling distribution when you are using t. When you're using z, you actually know it because you know the, sam the population uh, sigma standard, standard deviation, but with t you don't, and that's why we use t. So we're always going to have this estimated standard deviation of the sampling distribution. In this case, it's the sampling distribution of mean differences of d-bars, and that's basically the same as the sampling distribution of differences between means. We're just calling it the sampling distribution of mean differences, just to make, be consistent with how we do our calculations. In practice, it's not complicated at all. It's just like a single sample t. Just remember, we use the paired differences as if they were just simple raw scores. And as long as we carry that through in all possible ways, then that works for us. So the paired samples t-test, we can have an all-in-one formula here. It's pretty easy. It's just like the single sample t-test. So instead of an x-bar, we have a d-bar. And instead of s, we have s sub d. So instead of s sub x, so standard deviation of the raw scores, we had standard deviation of the difference scores. And in fact, we don't even need part of what we have with the single sample t-test, because with the single sample t-test, you actually have to think carefully what the uh, hypothesis value implied by the null hypothesis is, or the mean value implied by the null hypothesis is. With this, you don't. It's always just going to be zero. We're just going to use zero all the time. So our formula is pretty simple. d bar divided by the standard error. And the standard error of the formula is right there. SD, the standard deviation of the different scores, divided by the square root of n minus 1. So a little more detail about that standard error business. If the standard error of raw scores is that, then the standard error of the d scores is this. I'm not going to make you calculate this, but in case you need to, you just plug those d scores into your calculator and hit the standard deviation button. That's all you really do. So the standard deviation goes there and then you plug that into a little teeny formula that just divides that by the square root of n minus 1. So it's exactly like the standard deviation, uh, or sorry, the standard error of the mean for a single sample t uh, t test. Or z, except that it's divided by n minus 1 and it's not sigma. Anyway, it's the same as the single sample situation. Now as a small note, and many textbooks put an n minus 1 in the standard deviation formula, as this textbook would if you weren't using this for a standard error. And then those textbooks tend to switch that around and put an n in the standard error formula. It seems like the important thing is just to have n minus 1 in one of the places. So do it either way. Maybe try and follow this textbook, but don't worry about it too much. Put an n minus 1 somewhere. And I think the answers will be close enough that we're not it probably won't change any of our answers. I think the important thing is to follow the process here, not to get super pedantic about the math. I think you understand what's going on, um, if not exactly where to put the n minus 1, and that's a very low priority issue for me in teaching this class. So going back to some of the questions that we uh, sometimes ask previously to get ready to do our hypothesis test to kind of take inventory of what we got. What's our sample point estimate this time? It's the mean difference score from two paired samples. And what's the sampling distribution of that point estimate? It's the sampling distribution of all possible mean difference scores from all possible paired samples if the null hypothesis is true. What's the mean of that distribution? Well, it's zero. 
not really thrilling, it's just zero, but it's easy. What's the standard error of that sampling distribution? Well, you've got this little formula. The standard error of the difference of the difference, so SE sub D bar, is the standard error of the different scores of the raw difference, or sorry, the standard deviation of the raw difference scores divided by the square root of n minus 1. And step-by-step -step hypothesis test, same as with any other hypothesis test. Your hypotheses, you draw your graph, etc. Now, just another quick check. Keep in mind what our sampling distribution is. The sampling distribution here is the sampling distribution of mean differences of all possible mean difference scores from all possible paired samples, if the null hypothesis is true. This is equivalent to the distribution of differences between means for the independent samples t-test. Um, it's mathematically the same, but we call it mean differences to keep track of what we're doing mathematically in our calculations and make it consistent. So the bird's eye view of how to do this, we set up our data correctly or make sure our data, data are set up correctly, then we apply our formula and then we do everything else. Our formula is really simple, remember? d bar over the standard error. The standard error is just the standard deviation divided by the square root of n minus 1. That gives you your t observed. Plug that into a graph with your t critical, and you've got your answer. So now you have the formulas for all the tests we're going to use for comparing two means, or one mean, with uh, some sort of value. So this is comparing one mean with um, some sort of null hypothesis value given from outside the study. And these two are comparing two means to each other. And I believe that's all. So the next, I've broken this up into two lectures, so the next lecture I'm going to go through some examples step by step. So if things seem a little confusing from here, I mean, feel free to watch this video again, but definitely dive into the examples as soon as possible and try and work them through.